Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akiri Duluali, the headlines. The United Kingdom announces that it is sending long-range missiles to Ukraine to help the country defend itself against Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin says his forces will increase their attacks on Ukraine if Western countries continue to send long-range weaponry to the country. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky awards medals to doctors treating wounded servicemen receiving medical care in a Kiev hospital. The United Kingdom is sending its first long-range missile deployments to Ukraine in spite of a warning from Russian President Vladimir Putin. The UK's announcement comes the week after the United States said it would also be supplying rocket systems to Ukraine. The United Kingdom government says the Ukrainian military will be trained in how to use the M270 multiple launch rocket system launches in the coming weeks. Defense Secretary Ben Wallace says the UK was supplying Ukrainian troops with, quote, vital weapons they need to defend their country from an unprovoked invasion. As Russia's tactics change, so must our support to Ukraine, and that's according to Mr. Wallace. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Putin has warned the West that Russia would strike new targets if the United States started supplying Ukraine with longer-range missiles. Mr. Putin was quoted as saying in an excerpt of an interview with Brazil One state television channel that if such missiles are supplied, we will strike at those targets which we have not yet been hitting. Mr. Putin did not name the targets Russia planned to pursue if Western countries began supplying Ukraine with longer-range missiles. He said the fuss around Western weapon supplies to Ukraine was designed to drag out the conflict. Ukraine has been seeking multiple rocket launch systems such as the M270 and the M142 HIMARS to strike troops and weapons stockpiles at the Russian forces rear. The governor of Russia's Kursk region, which borders Ukraine, says the village of Tekkino was shelled this morning. Roman Starovoit said in a telegram update that there were no wounded or dead, but the main blow was inflicted on the local bridge where there is damage. The nearest two-story residential building with eight apartments and outbuildings nearby was also badly damaged. The roof of the house was slashed, the windows were completely broken, the cars burned down. There's damage on the territory of the sugar factory. The governors of several of Russia's border regions have multiple times accused Ukraine of firing on their settlements. There have also been reports of more shelling in some Ukrainian cities. The governor says Russian forces have continued to shell Ukraine's northeastern Kharkiv region on Sunday, killing, uh, rather wounding six people. Ole Sinahobov says that Russian shelling injured a 52-year-old man in the town of Shohev, two others in the village of Malnikova, and an elderly woman in the town of Balaklia. In Lohansk, the regional governor says the Russian shelling has wounded one woman and damaged more than 27 houses. And there's more news coming from the governor of the Lohansk region, who says the position of Ukrainian forces fighting in several Donetsk has worsened a little, and that's a quote. This is coming after he said that Ukraine's forces had pushed Russians back and regained control over half of the city. Serhii Haidai told national television that our defenders managed to undertake a counterattack for a certain time. They liberated almost half the city, but now the situation has worsened a little for us again. And Ukraine's military says the Russian army has lost 31,250 personnel since the start of the invasion on February the 24th. The general staff of Ukraine's armed forces also said Russia lost 1,386 tanks, 3,400 armored personnel vehicles, 680 artillery systems, 209 multiple launch rocket systems, 551 cruise missiles, 96 air defense systems, 211 aircraft, 176 helicopters, and 13 boats and ships. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has spent time with frontline troops in the eastern Donbass region 
where the Russian assault is focused. In his nightly address, he said he made a trip to the city of Lechonsk and the town of Solodar, saying he was proud of everyone he met, everyone he shook hands with. Uh, Mr. Zelensky also spoke to soldiers in the southeastern Zaporizhia region, describing them as heroes. The trip presented a rare journey outside the capital for the president since the war began in February. He also said that the terrible consequences of war could be stopped if Moscow ordered its troops to stop fighting in eastern Ukraine. After that, I went with the head of my office to the east. We were in Lysychansk. We were in Solodar. I am proud of everybody I met, everyone I shook hands with, everyone with whom I connected with and had expressed my support. We brought something for the military. I will not elaborate in detail on this. And there's something we brought from them to you. This is important. We brought you confidence. Russia struck Ukraine's capital, Kiev, with missiles yesterday for the first time in more than a month, while Ukrainian officials said a counterattack on the main battlefield in the east had retaken half of the city of Severodonetsk. Dark smoke could be seen from many miles away after the attack on two outlying districts of Kiev. Ukraine said the strike hit a rail car repair work. Moscow said it had destroyed tanks sent by Eastern European countries to Ukraine. At least one person was hospitalized, though there were no immediate reports of deaths. The strike was a sudden reminder of war in a capital where normal life has largely returned since Russian forces were driven from its outskirts in March. Ukraine says Russia had carried out the strike using long-range air-launched missiles fired from heavy bombers as far away as the Caspian Sea, a weapon far more valuable than the tanks Russia claimed to have hit. The attack was the first big strike in Kiev since last April when a missile killed a journalist. It's another example of Russian propaganda. They're trying to put responsibility on Ukrainians, even partly saying that Ukrainians are responsible for this. It's responsibility of Russians to use cruise missiles, very expensive, as you totally right, to attack peaceful facility to produce freight wagons, half wagons, and uh, wagons for grain to transport this grain to the European market, which unfortunately is not possible to do as it was done before because of the blockade of uh, their supports and the platforms. Ukrainian soldiers were manning their positions in trenches and shelters near Bakhmut in Ukraine's Donetsk region. One of the soldiers said they were under regular fire from Russian troops and the situation was difficult, but so far they were able to hold their positions. Serviceman Andrei and his comrades wished for more weapons support, especially anti-tank weapons which could make a difference. Russia has concentrated its forces in recent weeks on the small eastern industrial city of Severodonetsk, pursuing one of the biggest ground battles of the war in a bid to capture one of two eastern provinces, Luhansk and Donetsk, it claims on behalf of separatist proxies. The situation is difficult. We are beating out the enemy that came to our land. We must push them back from our borders so that they will never come again. Whoever of them doesn't want to go will leave here forever. What they do to our children and women, how they destroy our cities, they have only one fate, either go back home or in plastic bags. It is always hot in here. Our guys, our artillery, give decisive rebuff to the enemy. We have no way back. We can only go forward. They may try to regroup, let them try. Their fate is decided. The victory is ours. It is only a question of time. What we need is support. We need more anti-tank weapons. Though we have enough in our direction, with more anti-tank weapons, we would be able to destroy their tanks to cause maximal damage, and the enemy will be forced to flee from where they came. This is our home, our land. We will not give it away in no case. We will fight for every piece of this land.
Russia's defense ministry says Russian strikes destroyed tanks and other armored vehicles on the outskirts of Kiev that had been provided to Ukraine by European countries. A ministry spokesperson said T-72 tanks on the outskirts of Kiev supplied by Eastern European countries and other armored vehicles located on the premises of a car repair business had been destroyed in the airstrikes. The ministry's statement came after the Ukrainian capital was rocked by several explosions yesterday. Let's talk now to Timmy Tayo Kolawale, uh, who was a final year medical student in Ukraine and who is now speaking to us this morning uh, from Hungary. Good morning to you, uh, Timmy Tayo, and uh, thank you for your time. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. Many of the visuals you would have probably seen in the run up to this interview with you will make you believe that you've been very lucky to get out of Ukraine, wouldn't they? Yes, to an extent, yes. Um, Are you able to keep in touch? In... No, please go on, please go on. Yeah, most of them were just bringing um, memories to me, and I guess I'm just lucky for life. Indeed. Where were you when you were in Ukraine? Uh, I was in Zaporozhye which is where there have been quite a number of strikes recently, and uh, the reports indicate that a missile went by uh, one of the huge plants that is located there. So, again, more evidence that you've been really lucky. But now that you're in Hungary, what have you been up to? What have you been doing uh, since you got to Hungary? Uh, okay, so um, my school has actually planned for us to have our education online so that we can finish especially for the final year students so that we can um, graduate and all. So right now, presently, I'm actually writing my exams, my final exams, uh, which I'll be done with by next week. Good luck with that, I, I must say, and I'm sure uh, quite a lot of people wish you the very best with that, uh, uh, not least of all those of us who are waiting for doctors uh, at this end of the line. Uh, but uh, how, how has it been? How has the experience been? Of course, Hungary is not quite like Ukraine, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> it's very So different. tell me a bit about some of the differences. Uh, well, when it comes to being comfortable, I mean, it feels like a whole different thing. It feels like I'm coming, um, I'm my first year, I'm coming for the first time to a new country. So getting some things, having to buy some things to use, like pots and all the rest, um, for stores. It's a bit challenging, but uh, the best part about this place is that Hungary has been very, very accommodating. Uh, they give us free accommodation, which is a good thing. Uh, so having to think about accommodation has not really been on my mind. But when it comes to feeding and the language, the language barrier has been kind of like a struggle. Although there are some people that know English, but having to learn a new language after learning Ukrainian for six years is, it's different. How about the cultural context? Of course, as you just uh, referenced now, you spent a lot of time adapting to Ukrainian culture, knowing the nuances, how to relate with uh, those uh, from there. And then now, for this period, you are in another country and having to learn it all over again. Uh, have you had help in that regard? Have you uh, had some kind of structure where the authorities or indeed friends, colleagues, and so on, rally around to make it possible for you to be able to get this done uh, more quickly? Mm, well, like I said, there are um, a big number of people that know how to speak English. So um, it's actually, it's okay. It's working well with those that speak English. I've been able to communicate with them and they've been able to help in the ways that they can. But most times, to be honest, I'm more reserved. I, I prefer to just go out, shop for little things that I'm going to eat, and then come back and just relax, read for my exams, and that's all. So I don't really go out like that. I'm not really the other kind of person. Have, have the authorities, uh, the Nigerian authorities in uh... Uh, in Hungary reached out to you in any way? For example, I'm talking about the Nigerian Embassy, uh, the Nigerian Mission, the Nigerians in Diaspora Organization, and so on. Have you heard from any of those bodies? 
Okay, so um, this weekend that passed, that was day before yesterday, yesterday, I actually reached out to the Nigerians in diaspora because nobody actually reached out to me. I don't think they even knew that I was in Hungary at all. So I reached out to them um, and I was asking regarding getting a job or a school so that my stay here in Hungary can be kind of extended. So, yeah. But for the Nigerian embassy reaching out to me or something like that, no, it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Indeed. Uh, what, what, what would be your plan um, once you're done, as you said, God willing, next week you'll be done with the exams and then after that uh, it, it'll be to wait for the results to come out. And uh, fingers crossed uh, the results are positive and, and, and you actually have your certification as a doctor. What next after that? <laughs> okay, I've asked myself this question over and over again. And to be honest, I, for now, I don't know what next. I really want to um, further my education in medicine, um, try and do like an internship, get um, my specialty done and everything. But I'm still trying to put pieces back together. I'm still trying to get myself back together because I mean, I've been here for four months and people will say, okay, maybe that's a long time, enough time for me to know what next to do. But to be honest, I don't know what next. <laughs> well, it, from the way you have spoken, it does appear as if one of the things that is not next is a potential return to Nigeria. I, I don't know if, I don't know if... Uh, <laughs> No. No, Nigeria is not on the horizon. Okay, fine. So now we've established that. Let, let us look at what are the options. You talked about getting an internship. If you were offered an internship yes. in Hungary, would you take it? Yes, I will. But what, what if you were offered an internship back in Ukraine? Oh. Can you hear me? That is a very, <laughs> that is a very tricky question. Me? I guess the but answer will be it will depend exactly. It will depend on what is going on back in <laughs> Ukraine at the time. Yeah. What what yes. do your family yes. members what do your family members say to you? I'm sure they must be worried. They must have been worried sick, uh, and probably still worry a bit about the fact that you are all by yourself in a new country, trying to do your exams at the same time as try to settle down. Oh, 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 how how has that been? How has the interaction been? Uh, with, with, with your folks? Uh, okay. Uh, let me just say, my, my mom is super grateful every day. She makes me know that, like, every time she calls, she's like, I thank God that you're alive, that you're safe. Same thing with my sister. They are so grateful that at least I'm okay. And uh, when it comes to me being alone, to be honest, I, I don't think my family, they are, they are scared of that. I'm not trying to uh, paint my family as maybe they don't care, but I went to a boarding school. I um, stayed in, um, in the university in Nigeria all by myself. I served all by myself in, a, in the north, for that matter. I served in Sokoto. So I've practically lived my life alone for a long time. So I think they are kind of used to it. They are kind of used to the fact that I can take care of myself. You are self-sufficient. In, in other words, you're quite self-sufficient, so to speak. Yes. Yes. But how about, how about the friends you made in Ukraine? I'm sure that in the aftermath of uh, uh, the start of the war, everybody fled, so to speak. Uh, those who had to go home went home. Those who had to go to other countries like you went to other countries. Do you keep in touch with any of those people? Uh, it does appear as if uh, there's someone who is, who is very anxiously trying to get hold of you, but we're, we're, we'll soon be through. Uh, my final question will be, are you keeping in touch with your friends that you made in Ukraine? Yes. Yes, I am. Where are they? Where are uh, some of them? I Okay, I have one of my friends staying here with me. Uh, we got the same accommodation here in Hungary. Um, I have some of them in Germany. Some of them are back home in Nigeria. 
uh, some are in Netherlands. Yes, and we still keep in touch once in a while. I still try to talk to them. Uh, there are some that they left for on, from Hungary down to Germany. Before they left, we're able to see each other, catch up, just have some time together. I can only say that, one, we wish you the very best with the examinations and hope that uh, you qualify uh, uh, and graduate uh, in, in spite of the upheaval uh, that has attended the, pro, uh, the process. And after that, you make the right decision for yourself uh, and indeed for the family. And good luck with all of that and Godspeed. Thank you so much, Timitai Kolawale, uh, for your time this morning. Thank we'll keep up much. with you. We'll keep on following your progress and we'll bring you back sometime quite soon. Thank you very much. Ukraine's ambassador to Germany, Andrei Melnik, blasted the lack of heavy arms supply from Berlin to pop up Kiev in its fight against Moscow, accusing German authorities of refusing to supply even old hardware to the country. Melnik stated in a social media post that the German government cynically refuses to supply us even with old Leopard 1 tanks and Marder IFVSs, branding such behavior a disgrace that would go down in history. The remarks came a day after the chairman of the Ukrainian parliament and Roslan Stefanchuk visited Germany apparently to rally support for delivery of heavy arms. Melnik has repeatedly attacked German leaderships over the purported lack of support from Berlin for Ukraine in the ongoing conflict with Russia. He also launched a bitter personal attack on German Chancellor Olaf Scholz over his refusal to visit Kiev to show solidarity with Ukraine. And U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Bridget Brink says the U.S. will support authorities in that country in their investigation of possible war crimes committed by members of the Russian forces. And this was during her visit to Bodoryanka. She said, I think the efforts of the Prosecutor General are really important, and I do not think they should stop or be paused just because the war continues. I think it's really important uh, to bear witness to these horrible atrocities. And being here today has only strengthened my resolve to help ensure justice and accountability. I think the efforts of the Prosecutor General are really important, and I do not think they should stop or be paused uh, just because the war continues. I think people deserve justice, and they deserve justice now. I think one of the challenges is that there are a lot of cases. And how do you prioritize and order them and do them in the midst of a country in war? Yeah, there are a lot of challenges, but that won't deter us. We're providing a lot of expert assistance. We do have a special advisor on war crimes who works in the State Department, Beth Van Schock, and she and I actually met before coming here, and she is working directly with the Prosecutor General and leading our efforts, and we are also using many other mechanisms uh, in order to support this process. And I can tell you, I personally will make sure that we here on the ground do everything to support it through various U.S. government mechanisms whether it's through the State Department, USAID, or other agencies. News coming in as uh, we are going on with the program this morning. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is facing a vote of confidence from members of his party later on uh, today. Big news out of there and how this could possibly impact all that Britain is doing, particularly uh, internationally. Uh, we're being joined by a correspondent in the British capital, London, uh, Juliana Olayinka, uh, via the phone. Uh, the train services, I understand, are down, so Juliana is making her way uh, through the city. Uh, Juliana, good morning to you. Thank you uh, for your time this morning. What exactly uh, is jo uh, Boris Johnson facing? Good morning, Laddie. Just checking you can hear me well. Yes, yes, please go Great. ahead. Great. Well, um, as you said, the bombshell announcement um, today is that uh, Boris Johnson uh, will be uh, facing a vote of confidence in his leadership from co Conservative MPs at about 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. tonight. Um, just to give some context to this, this is all really about uh, the Partygate scandal. Uh, the Prime Minister was fined uh, 50 pounds in April for attending a rule-breaking birthday party uh, for himself in June 2020. This was a time uh, when the entire country was locked down, um, uh, forced to stay away from uh, family members. Uh, people were not able to see their dying loved ones in hospital or large crowds were able to gather um, at funeral homes. Um, there was 
a, uh, an investigation uh, about these parties because there were several parties um, that uh, people were talking about uh, by a very a veteran senior civil servant, Sue Gray. According to her findings, they were so um, uh, strong uh, that a police investigation um, had to take place. Over 84 individuals, including uh, the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie uh, Simons, and the Chancellor, Rishi Shunak, um, as well as um, 84 others, received uh, fixed penalty notices uh, by uh, the Metropolitan Police. Then we got uh, the bombshell uh, report from Sue Gray a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I think the Prime Minister thought it was all over. Uh, but unfortunately for him, uh, since uh, the, um, I would say, unredacted, however, there were some things that were removed from Sue Gray's report, um, more um, uh, allegations have come to light. The fact that uh, security guards uh, were abused by drunken uh, civil servants who attended these parties. Um, you know, red wine was had to be wiped off um, the walls and uh, vomit um, had to be cleaned up uh, from the floors. It just has been getting worse and worse and worse. And we saw that uh, during the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. There's a little bit of pantomime, as the British public like. Anytime we did see uh, Boris Johnson appear um, next to the royal family, uh, there were loud, roaring boos. Um, he's been falling um, in the polls. And yesterday, which is really important, that 54th threshold of MPs um, who had to submit letters to Sir Graham Brady, it was reached. And so today, there will be a vote on his future. One more question uh, on this. Uh... We know that the law stipulates that if, if he manages to get over this vote of confidence, uh, perhaps he's immune for the next 12 months. But the reports are also saying that that law could be altered, in which case, if he gets over this, then it's quite possible that his leadership could be challenged again quite soon. Well, certainly his leadership could be challenged. I think a lot of political pundits here in the UK are referring back to Margaret Thatcher as well as... Um, the, um, we're looking also, so, so Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May. Now, Theresa May, of course, everybody can remember, she had um, a vote of confidence a couple of times, but then within eight months, she resigned. Uh, with Margaret Thatcher, it was within eight days, um, and it hasn't spelt well. Now, what we need today is for a minimum of 180 MPs to say that they don't feel confident with uh, Boris Johnson and... It is a secret ballot. We, we know that Boris Johnson is very, very popular. He is part of the framework of the British establishment here. So coming up against him publicly, you've got to be pretty strong-minded to be able to do that. But because it's a secret ballot, it is still a possibility that he could lose. But yes, within the law at present, he will be immune from going up for another vote of confidence. But as you can imagine, this is pretty strong news, especially after... A four days of celebration, celebrating somebody who's been on the throne for 70 years, given all her service to the country, and then the Prime Minister the day after, uh, on a very rainy day where there are tube strikes in London. It's just not a great day for the Prime Minister, I've got to say. Indeed, it, it doesn't appear it is, although it might brighten up a little if he gets over this hump, uh, as you say, between six and eight later on. We'll be, we'll be looking out uh, for you uh, for updates of that. Uh, just... just uh, because I referenced it uh, as I was introducing you uh, to the program, why are, why are the train services down? Oh, gosh, well, there has been a long-running um, debate and dispute between uh, the RMT, the train union, um, and uh, the transport secretary, Grant Schatz. Uh, lots of money uh, was uh, funneled into uh, the train service during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, uh, lots of that money the British government are trying to uh, claw back, and they're doing it by redu reducing staff. Uh, they're also doing it by uh, trying to find new and inventive ways to make trains driverless. Uh, the RMT union really not happy about that. They say that their staff are, are being abused on a daily basis. They're not being looked after. Wages are slowing. Uh, so this has happened today, and I've got to tell you, it's pretty awful um, outside in London at the moment, especially because it's raining. But then also, in the next couple of weeks, we are expecting uh, the worst set of train strikes that this country has ever seen. Uh, weeks upon weeks of train strikes. 
They are still in consultation with the government. Uh, but of course, uh, for some lucky few who've had two bank holidays, they get to have another holiday again today, laddie, uh, because the government are advising everybody to work from home, not me, though. Well, yeah, I was about to say that, that not you. Uh, if only, if only uh, you could be that lucky, you wouldn't have to brave uh, the rain <laughs> on, your way to, on your way to work. But uh, thank you, Juliana, and do stay safe and warm, uh, equally importantly, as you make your way to work. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll expect to hear from you about that all-important vote later on in the day. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thank right. you. Our correspondent, Juliana Olainka, uh, reporting there from the British capital, uh, London. Let's talk now to Captain Bish Johnson, a security expert and retired U.S. Army captain. He's also a national defense and military strategist. He joins us from our Abuja studios. Uh, captain Johnson, thank you for your time. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Let's, uh, let's look at the situation on, uh, on the ground there. There might be a pause uh, to the uh, uh, supply of British weapons that we've been reporting, especially if, as we hear, uh, Boris Johnson facing a vote of confidence later on today. If he loses that vote of confidence, uh, uh, there might be a pause, not necessarily a halt, but a pause uh, to the supply of those weapons. But do you think that uh, the Russians uh, will carry out the threat uh, to take on new targets if the West, and by that I'm sure they mean the U.S. and Britain, uh, begin to supply uh, Ukraine with uh, heavy weapons? Yeah, good morning for, uh, good morning, thank you for having me. Um, yes, it, there's a possibility that uh, the Russians may um, uh, carry out their threat uh, should um, uh, the U.S. and its Western allies uh, supply, uh, continue to supply, particularly weapons with long range uh, that are capable of reaching the territory of of, uh, of Russia. So far, the West have resisted every attempt in supplying such weapons uh, to the Ukrainians. Uh, but if the Russians feels that the kind of weapons, heavy weaponry that is being supplied um, uh, to the Ukrainians we have the capability of getting to that territory. There's a possibility that they may uh, make good on the threat that they have so far been uh, threatening the West and, and the U.S. Before we come to your role as a national defense and security strategist, I want to talk, I want to, talk to you now in your role as a soldier. Um, and on the ground, uh, you have the Russians, you have the Ukrainians. Uh, 14 weeks now, this war has been going on uh, more than 100 days. Uh, and there are people who are saying that, look, there is no advantage to anyone anymore. In the first few weeks, uh, there might have been advantages on one side or the other, but there are no advantages. And the people bearing the brunt are the soldiers on the ground uh, 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 in Ukraine. From your experience as a soldier, would you consider that to be a fair comment? Would I consider that to be a what? A fair comment, a fair comment. Would you consider it to be true? Yes. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. It is. It is a fair comment. Look, um, there is no usually easy way out to this kind of crisis. And most of the time, these kind of problems are not resolved through, through military actions. They are usually res resolved through uh, diplomatic solutions. And even with the military actions, what they are doing with the military actions is to try to gain some kind of advantage that will allow them to present some conditions eventually when they go to negotiating table. Because at the end of the day, this crisis will have to be resolved at the negotiating table. Um, there is no easy way out of it. Military solution is not the way out of it. They must eventually come back to the negotiating table and negotiate on how to end this. If that doesn't happen, I don't see this thing ending anytime soon. It's going to be a very protracted war. Um, the Ukrainians' capacities has been boosted by NATO uh, with other European countries. And so their capacity to match Russia is there. However, Russia, of course, as we know, is the second most powerful military in the world. So they still have a whole bunch of arsenals to continue this war. So if no diplomatic solution is sought now, 
I fear that this war is going to be a very protracted war, and those who are suffering will continue to suffer. The ordinary people, the soldiers, and their families will continue to suffer. Let us look at what you just said now, at least from a national security and defense strategy. The Russians at the start said that, look, it was important for them to do this because they still needed a buffer against NATO and the EU countries in terms of defense. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, said that, look, they're a sovereign country and that they expect to be able to take decisions uh, that suit them. And that was what led to this, uh, uh, to this protracted conflict, as it were, right now. Now, you talk about the fact that, look, this is not going to be resolved unless there are, there's peace and there's negotiations and so on. Uh, but do you see either side being willing to make the concessions? Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron was capitated yesterday because he suggested that, you know, there might be need to offer the Russians some concessions. Everybody jumped at him because he said that. The other day, uh, there, there was the suggestion that perhaps some territorial uh, um, considerations for peace could be brought on the table. But it seems as if the positions have hardened uh, on either side, uh, and, and therefore what you want or what you think is feasible in terms of uh, uh, peace talks are not going to happen. Well, th that is the whole essence of the war in the first place. The, the essence of the war in the first place is to give them some kind of advantage and leverage when they do go to the negotiating table. Um, you don't want to go to the negotiating table from a very weak position, because if you do, you're going to get less. So, but at the end of the day, there will have to be some concessions made on both parties. Because if, you, if there is no such concession made on both from uh, either party, the, 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 the war will continue. And I don't think that the war is in the best interest of either Russians or the Ukrainians or even the West. So I, I think at the end of the day, concessions will be made. What the concessions are going to be is what I cannot tell you. But at the end of the day, there will be compromises if this war is going to come to an end. But if neither of them is ready to compromise, which I, I don't see them compromising right now, because um, until they fight to the point that uh, the both parties are weakened, there, there will be no, um, there will be no incentive for them to go to the negotiating table. So, yeah, at the end of the day, there will be some concessions. What it will be, I don't know. Outside forces will play a role in that, wouldn't they? Already, uh, Turkey has uh, has indicated that it's willing to host those kind of talks. It had hosted uh, some before, and that it's willing to host again. Uh, President Erdogan is still on good terms with Russia, and is still on good terms with the Ukrainians. But then, when I mention outside forces, I'm referring to the likes of. Uh, the United States and Britain, in the case of Ukraine, the people who have been supporting Ukraine that you mentioned with arms. And then on the part of uh, Russia, you have uh, China and other such countries in the East uh, who have continued to buy, like India, who have continued to buy Russian oil and all of that. These are people who can play a role in this. But do you see them wanting to play that role? Um, at, the, at the very moment, Turkey seems to be um, uh, the country that is, you know, foremost uh, making effort in trying to play that role. Yes, outside forces, we have to play that role. Um, there is an adage in Igbo language that when you translate to English, says that somebody who um, fainted uh, does not pour himself water to, to, to recover. And so you see that the two parties are going to have to need, you know, outside assistance in helping them to try to come to the negotiating table. But let me say this as well. Sure, uh, the Western countries are already playing a role. Um, China is already playing a role. Turkey is already playing a role. But let me tell you, Africa can play even greater role in trying to bring this crisis to an end. Um, a few days ago, the AU chairman was in uh, sushi with Russian president, um, discussing the impact of the war, particularly on Africa, uh, most importantly, Sub-Saharan Africa. African countries, since this war began, had taken strategic positions based on their own uh, uh, specific um, uh, challenges and interests. They've maintained neutral position. They either absconded from voting at the United Nations or absconded from even making condemning um, Russia in this regard. So they are looking at the challenges that the continent faces. 
uh, which will require them to have, which the challenges are, of course, multiple and require them to have diversity of partners. So they don't want to align to either with the Russians or the West because they have maintained that neutrality throughout the course of this crisis. They seem to be the people that have the most integrity to intervene in this crisis. So, yeah, sure, outside forces will have to come in. The West is there already playing a role. Um, China is playing a role already, so is India, Turkey. But I think Africans can even play a much greater role in trying to bring this crisis to an end by making uh, uh, that argument that, look, this war is, is not in the best interest of any of the parties and that it is even equally affecting neutral parties like African countries. Indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Captain Bish Johnson, uh, retired U.S. Army Captain, National Defense and Military Strategist. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Russian energy giant Gazprom said this week that gas exports to China via the uh, power of Siberia pipeline have continued to grow. The deliveries are part of a bilateral long-term contract between Gazprom and China National Petroleum Corporation. The agreement on gas supplies via the pipeline was reached in 2014, with Gazprom and CNPC signing a 30-year contract. The $400 billion agreement is Gazprom's biggest deal ever, and the power of Siberia is the first natural gas pipeline between Russia and China. According to Gazprom, it is currently working on the Power of Siberia 2 project, which involves the construction of a gas pipeline to China through the territory of Mongolia. The pipeline will be capable of delivering as much as 50 billion cubic meters of gas once it is operational. Gazprom intends to become China's biggest natural gas supplier, accounting for more than 25% of Chinese exports by 2035. Let's talk to Laddie Williams of our business desk. Morning, Morning. Laddie. Morning. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this, uh, moving away from oil and gas and coming to currencies now. Right. Uh, uh, Russia is holding one-third of, yes. uh, uh, of, of its, uh, uh, the world's yuan reserves. Yuan, of course, being the currency uh, China. Uh, of China. Right. Right. <laughs> is that a strategic... Shift? It, it, it's, uh, it, it looks quite, you know, strategic coming from, you know, Russia because we know how, uh, you know, the financial sanctions have impacted the economy. Uh, they're not able to use, you know, most of the traditional uh, ways to send and receive money uh, globally. So now uh, a report from the IMF, you know, is showing that uh, the, uh, the, the dollar has continued a two-decade decline. You know, when it comes to uh, being a reserve uh, currency for, you know, most of these countries. And that's actually showing a, a sign that, you know, most of these countries are now, you know, using other denominations, other currencies at this point to also shore up their external reserves. And uh, that is, you know, kind of reducing, you know, the, the, the dominance we've seen you know, with the U.S. dollar, we've seen the two-decade decline now uh, recorded by IMF. And uh, looking at Russia, we know how Russia, you know, is trying to move away, you know, from uh, most of uh, the, the, the dollar, you know, at this point to try and make sure they're able to, you know, withstand some of these sanctions. And we've seen them use gold. We've also seen them also, you know, increase their uh, yuan uh, deposits. And by 2021, they had quite a huge, about a third of that. So we, it, it looks like a plan that's been in the works well, for quite know, a while. For quite a while. And, you know, it, it, it just goes to show that, you know, it's getting to a point where, you know, the U.S. dollar still has that dominance, but there's a decline we're seeing now. It, it's uh, gotten to about 59% in the last quarter, you know, of 2021. I was seeing other denominations actually, you know, come to the fore, like the yuan and uh, the Australian dollars, you know, and this just goes to show that countries are, you know, being cautious now, you know, Maybe trying to have a bets. more diversified, you know, uh, external reserve because you never know when you could actually become an unfriendly nation. So you want to have options, you know, with the, with the way uh, geopolitics is going right now. And we've also seen Russia try to move into the cryptocurrency space, you know, trying to launch that uh, CBDC. Absolutely. You, you know, and at the end of the day, all of this is to try and bypass sanctions, try and also make 
you know, payments, all their obligations, because we're seeing how this is impacting their bond Absolutely. payments. Right. You know, right now they're not able to make their bond payments and, you know, a default is actually, you know, in the works now. And nobody wants a default, a sovereign default for that matter. So we're seeing a lot happening that uh, it's, that it's currency wars at this point. Uh, yes, indeed. I, I, about speaking about unfriendly countries, uh, I, I don't know whether now Russia would consider uh, Azerbaijan an unfriendly country because <laughs> of, uh, it's discussing gas supplies to new European buyers to replace Russian oil. Exactly. It's still that move, you know, we've seen Europe try to wean off Russian gas at this point. And we're seeing Azerbaijan actually look to step up. They're looking at increasing production at this time, but all of this will cost, you know, money for Azerbaijan. They have to, you know, invest in a more uh, structure to be able to meet up uh, this demand. So th this is what Azerbaijan is doing right now. They are trying to ramp up production, see if they can meet up, you know, with uh, this gap, you know, that we're seeing with Russia. Because right now Europe is desperate. Europe is making... They'll uh, take it wherever they Wherever they, they can. You know, we've seen that happen with, you know, they, they've also uh, started making moves, you know, in Africa, trying to see how they can get, you know, LNG, you know, across the sea and, uh, you know, over to Europe. Because at the end of the day, it's becoming really serious. And the winter is coming. And we know how <laughs> yeah. cold the winter gets. And they need their heating you know, when, when that time comes. But, you know, it's a gradual process. It will take time, uh, no matter how time. fast you want it to yeah. move. Yeah, so Russia will still, you know, for now, continue making uh, money because they're still, you know, heavily reliant on Russian gas at this point. But we're seeing them make moves, and they're making moves faster. And, uh, and th th their minds are more focused on They're more focused. This. So at some point, we, we could see that actually take effect. But after many years... Germany faces 5 billion euros a year hit at, in the same effort trying to replace exactly, yeah. uh, Russian gas. Yeah, because, you know, the, the subsidiary for Gazprom, they had that in uh, Germany. That was called the uh, Germania. Right. You know, so at this point, they've not been able to get gas, you know, because obviously Russia has cut, you know, gas supplies to that. So... Taxpayers now are having to, you know, sort out, uh, because once you're getting alternatives, you're paying more, you know, to get uh, more gas to... Obviously, <laughs> every, every, to, a, to a gas from, you know, subsidiary, because we've seen Russia pull out, you know, of, of, of supplying gas there. So at the end of the day, this is going to cost them a lot of money. And we're seeing that already uh, play out. They've not given a figure yet on uh, how much taxpayers are going to have to I'm gonna pay. I've got to cough up for yeah, all of this. But uh, it, it's looking like it's going to be a lot of money. And but we're seeing them actually try to, you know, make use of the reserves that were actually there, you know, before uh, Russia actually cut off supplies right. to that subsidiary. So it's, uh, it remains to be seen how that plays out, really. Indeed. Uh, Laddie, thank you for the perspective. Uh, more of that, of course, will come on Business Morning and Business Incorporated. Business Morning right after this show and uh, right. Business Incorporated at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you. See you then. Thank you. Let's take a look at what is happening in the world of sports as it relates to the war in Ukraine. Football fans in Kiev were shaken after Ukraine lost their final a World Cup qualification match against Wales in Cardiff last night. An own goal from Ukraine winger and captain Andriy Yamalenko, who headed a Gareth Bale free kick into his own net, decided the contest. Hopes had been high after Ukraine beat Scotland last week and needed to beat Wales to book their place at the World Cup in Qatar in November. Many of Ukraine's supporters said watching their team play well would have boosted the morale of soldiers who are currently fighting against Russia. Meanwhile, Wales manager Rob Page praised the Ukrainian supporters and their players for their outstanding performance in spite of the war currently going on in their country. There were emotional scenes at the end of the game as Ukraine's disappointed players showed their appreciation to more than 2,000 supporters at the Cardiff City Stadium. They were then joined by the Welsh players who, before undertaking their own lap of honour, also saluted the Ukrainian fans. In the meantime, domestic football in Ukraine, believe it or not, is set to resume in August after President Volodymyr Zelensky granted his approval. The Ukrainian Premier League season was terminated in April, having been unable to resume from its winter break due to the Russian invasion of the country in February. Ukrainian Football Association President Andrei Pavelko revealed that he held talks with Mr. Zelensky 
uh, with the country's leader agreeing that football can play an important role in boosting morale in the ongoing conflict. Shakhtar Donetsk had led the league at the time it was terminated. The 12-time Ukrainian champions are considered one of the leading clubs in the country, together with Dynamo Kiev. And just before we go, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has paid a visit to wounded servicemen receiving medical care in a Kiev hospital. During his visit, Mr. Zelensky awarded medals to the doctors, expressing gratitude for their work both in the hospitals and in the field. Earlier this month, Mr. Zelensky said that up to 100 soldiers are killed in action per day and around 500 soldiers are wounded. Russian forces have advanced deep into the ruined eastern factory city of Severodonetsk, but Ukrainian troops were there still holding out. That's how we wrap up the program this morning. Thanks for being with us. My name is Ladi Akiri Dolwale. Uh, there will be an update of all these stories uh, within the world today at 5 o'clock, so do watch out for that. But for now, do have a pleasant Monday and a pleasant week ahead.